Um, we are now concluding the third of a series of lectures sponsored for Socialist Week here at Iowa State. And I wanted to sort of uh, give you a little bit of information about the collective. It meets uh, at twice a, whoops, what, write this down. It meets every two weeks. Uh, first meeting will be um, Monday at 7 o'clock in the Commons. You're welcome to, to join us in a, a critical reading group and uh, meet the rest of the collective. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about who's sponsoring the lecture and then, then introduce Elaine Rapping to you. Um, the series has been sponsored by the Committee on Lectures, which is funded by the government of the student body here, also by the Department of Journalism, Department of Sociology, and by Women's Studies. Hope I haven't left anyone out. Um, Elaine Rapping comes to us from Adelphi University. She has written a number of uh, publications. She writes for Now the Village Voice. She's written for The Guardian and for The Nation. She's working on her, her new book, which is entitled The Movie of the Week, Private Stories and Public Events. She's also written a book entitled The Looking Glass World of Nonfiction TV. And so I'm sure that part of her talk will be describing to you about the work she's doing in her new book. I'd like you to join me in welcoming Elaine Rappin to ISU. going to do here is first um, I'm going to talk and then I have a videotape with some clips of TV movies which is the subject obviously um, and we can discuss and then you can we can we can discuss um, whatever you want to discuss um, all right first of all this presentation and the videotape that I have is based on a book which I'm about which I'm pretty much finished with, which is, to my knowledge, the only full-length study of made-for-TV movies. As important sociological and cultural artifacts and events. And I have for a long time considered this an odd state of affairs because critiques and analyses of TV texts, as the current academic jargon has it, um, are really something now of an academic left boom industry. I mean, people are writing about television like crazy. And forms like soap operas, um, series like Hill Street Blues, LA Law, 30 something, even stuff like Dynasty, are treated with enormous seriousness by media analysts. But TV movies, are almost universally dismissed as being the worst kind of trash, um, I, it's in, in my experience. Um, they're looked down upon. I think that one of the reasons for this is that, that the style, they're not hip, they're not chic, they're social realism, and people find that um, not quite trendy enough. However, um, what I'm going to argue is that I think that this is a major mistake because as sociological events as well as dramatic treatments of important social issues, um, in my view, they're the most important dramatic form on TV. And um, often they're the most dramatically and politically powerful for reasons which I'll try to convince you of. Um, now. I want to insert something here, um, which is that in what I'm going to say, um, and in the examples that we'll, that we'll look at, which happen to be examples of the best of the form, it may seem that I'm stressing the positive aspects of the form more than the negative. And I want to be clear on this. This is intentional. Um, and it doesn't imply that I'm not aware of the political contradictions and limits of the form or that um, I'm unaware of what the TV industry is about. Um, of course, no network primetime TV show is going to be about what this, <laughs> this week is about, which is socialism. That's not going to happen on TV. Um, However, I think that most of us, and certainly people who are coming to a lecture on a, you know, for Socialist Week, 
are already well aware of certain kinds of things about commercial TV, which I sort of feel like, really, I guess in respect to you, I don't think I have to repeat. I mean, even Time Magazine, or for that matter, People Magazine, take certain things for granted by now about what TV is about. For example, everybody knows that TV is about selling audiences to sponsors. You know, that that's really, I mean, that's the bottom line is making money. It's not about producing art, and it is certainly not about telling us the political truth about American life. That is a foregone conclusion. Um, in fact, since sponsors are selling a way of life, which is their lifeblood, which is based on certain ideological givens that go with capitalism, and I'll just mention just the main ones. The first one, obviously, is consumerism. The second one is patriotism. And um, this is, I, I can't help but comment that um, in the last few weeks, this issue of patriotism on the media is just um, been absolutely appalling. I mean, the war effort is being plugged so much by the media. And there are reasons for that. I mean, people do not want to give up the American way of life. They don't want to give up the notions of private property and individual corporate uh, power and that kind of thing. And it's about oil. So, um, and, t and television is, uh, is, is really plugging this a lot. And finally, and I think maybe um, most importantly maybe for what I'm going to be saying, individualism as the answer to all problems that we come up against as citizens in this country. In other words, television is just, it's, it's, it's got a, a set of conventions in which when you're dealing with dramatic narrative, every problem is perceived as a personal human interest story that has to be solved by private people, usually through a family. Because anything else, saying that it's a social issue and that, the, you know, that we should deal with it collectively, that the government should deal with it, is smacks of socialism. Ah, you know, nobody wants that. So what gets put on the air can't diverge too much from this. And I just want to go on the record as letting you know that I know that. And as we'll see, these aspects of TV conventions are not, com are not forgotten, even in the, t the best TV movies that I'm going to be talking to you about. What interests me more, however, is the way in which certain TV movies, actually more than you might imagine, and more, I'm convinced, than most TV forms, manage to transgress the limits of their genre and project, in contradictory ways, progressive images and messages, um, particularly about women, actually, which, which we'll talk about. And so how this happens and how it affects viewers is worth considering because um, unlike a lot of traditional left thinking, I think it's wrong to think of television as being an ideological monolith. And it, it really is a contradictory form where there's a lot of different forces in the production and, and even in our viewing that conflict and contest, and that interests me a lot. Um, and if we forget about this or don't understand it, we're going to miss out on ways that it can be used in our families, in classrooms, and I think also at public events as useful educational tools. So I just want to say that. All right, now first, before getting into the, the form itself, I'm going to start by placing the TV movie form in um, a social and historical context by laying out some general statistics about the role of home TV, which some of you may be aware of, but a lot of you may not be aware of. And that if you're not, I think you'll, you know, it, it's, it's shocking, but it's also interesting. Um, first of all, the average American home has at least one TV, most have more, and it is on an average of seven and a half hours a day in, in every home. Now, that is a lot of time. And the fact that we are not sitting attentively in front of the screen 
you know, eagerly taking this in the way we do in a theater, I don't really think makes any difference because it, it, TV is a member of the family. It sits there literally in our living room and it transmits these images and these messages that we get even if we're walking from room to room, if we're talking to other people, if we're doing something else, you know, grading papers, uh, arguing with whoever, whatever. The fact is that it's a presence and these things are being absorbed. And um, so in that sense, it's a member of the family and I think unfortunately, it is very often the most dominant member of the family because it's a constant presence and it's always talking to you. And unfortunately, in a lot of families today, people are not talking to each other. They don't even sit down and have dinner together anymore. But the television is on all the time. So it's, it's what we hear. So secondly, 70% of all Americans get all of their information about the world from television. Now, um, this is, um, I guess, surprising to a lot of people, but it's true. Uh, and the fact that illiteracy is a major issue, and it's yet undocumented, you know, the extent of illiteracy in our country makes this even more important. Because if you can't read, you don't have any choice. You can't read the New York Times. You can't read the Nation. Uh, you don't have any choices. You can only get your information from pictures and from people talking to you. So you've got that factor too, and functional illiteracy is, is rampant. So these facts speak to a clear reality which we can deplore, but it isn't about to go away. For most Americans, TV is the public sphere. Um, in other words, um, it's the place where we have public discourse about issues. And it's the place where most Americans get our views of reality, particularly kids, um, where we learn, quote unquote, what issues are important, what's good and bad, how to behave, what and how to think about issues. And I think, you know, particularly interestingly, um, it tells us what terms we can use in thinking about issues. You know, which again, I mean, just to use socialism as an example. I mean, socialism is not an option for thinking about the answer to our problems in this society. That's, you know, because TV doesn't suggest it to people. And I know, you know, my students, you know, wouldn't even dream of thinking about that because the limits of the discourse on TV are very, are very strong and dominant in their minds. So. Anyhow, we're not talking about chopped liver here. Um, this is the ideological big time. Now, how do made-for-TV movies fit into this? Um, made-for-TV movies play a very interesting and important role in this structure, uh, much more than series TV. And the reason is because they treat important social issues of the, mo of the moment in much more depth and with much more ideological clarity, for better or for worse, than a half hour or an hour show can possibly do. They're, they're, they're two hours, sometimes, you know, like in, in the case of something like Roots, they go on for days and days and days. And they're extensive, dramatically compelling ways in which social issues are presented to the public. And they, make, they have a big impact. Um, the reason that they do that is, it's complicated, but I'll just say this. Um, they are used, interestingly, to fulfill a mandate which was laid down by the Federal Communications Commission, although it's really taken seriously, that the networks and local affiliates have a responsibility to provide a certain amount of public interest programming because the airwaves happen to be a natural resource. And the license to run a TV station is a right that you're given, you know, just like the right to uh, use any other natural resource. So therefore, there is, on the democratic rhetoric side of it, this, this thing, you're supposed to have a certain amount of public interest programming. Um, and um, if you don't, 
you're likely to get your license taken away, but actually that never happens. What does happen, however, is that networks are concerned about their own image. I mean, they don't want to appear uh, taxi. <laughs> you know, it's, it's important that they, every once in a while, run something that's, that, that, that's serious. Now, network news, I mean national news, not local news, na network news also fulfills this function. But, and this is, I think, usually very surprising to intellectuals, network news is watched by very, very few people. It has very low ratings. It's a, it's a total money loser. And the only reason it's kept on the air is because, again, the networks would look real bad if they um, did what would really make money for them, which is to drop the nightly news and run um, yet another version of Let's Make a Deal or uh, Vanna White or something, you know, which is really what they would like to do because that's where they make money. Um, TV movies, on the other hand, draw huge audiences. And this is because of their contradictory nature, which we will look at. Um, they are at once promoted as current events and information so that they're, you know, they're, they're presented as serious discussions of serious issues, um, but they are also promoted as sensational, dramatic stories, and therefore they make a lot of money. Um, for example, uh, if you're watching, you know, TV movies are one-shot deals, unlike series. So um, when the teasers come on that promote this movie of the week, uh, invariably, what they will stress in the little clips that they show you is the sexiest and or most violent clip that they can find. Um, and that is because that's how they draw audiences. On the other hand, when you're talking about social issues in this day and age, sexuality and violence are in fact social issues. So that often when you see these movies, like, I don't know if we'll have time, but The Burning Bed is one, is one example, um, where the clips made it look like this was going to be just a totally violent movie. In fact, very, very little of that movie actually shows physical violence. Most of it is about the issue of domestic violence and the way in which the institutions of this country keep women from um, getting out of that situation. Okay, now, anyhow, these are really the blockbuster events of prime time. As many as 100 million people can watch a TV movie on a single evening. And that is actually somewhat incredible to me because it, is, it might be in this fragmented, alienated world we live in where um, a lot of people live alone. I mean, where I live in Manhattan, 40% of the population lives alone. Um, it is a shared social event that um, people watch all together at the same night and if, you know, and talk to the people that they're with, but also the next day and, and sometimes for several days afterwards, they'll continue to talk about it. And it may be the first time that they've ever talked about these issues. Um, so if you're talking about something like a movie like The Day After, or Roe versus Wade, which is what we're going to look at. We are talking about national public discourse, which may be the most dominant form of national public discourse on crucial political events and issues. So again, for better or worse, and a lot of times it is for worse, um, they are the forms through which most Americans can learn about and begin discussing these questions. I am really always impressed with this because in, I've been writing this book for two years, and when I go to work in the morning after um, one of these big things comes on, um, the people in my office, not my colleagues, but the secretaries and the students, sort of like really just, they sort of bombard me, like, what did you think about it? And they love to talk about it because for them, it's the first time they've thought about some of these issues, and um, they like to talk about it. So it is the public sphere and it is public discourse. Um, so anyway, I think that we demean them or ignore them at our own peril because they matter to people and, and you've got to take that seriously. 
Okay, now before we look at the videotape, I want to spend just some time going into some detail about one particular movie which captures in a really neat way um, what TV movies do best, but also what the limits are of what they can do and how contradictory and um, politically confusing they also are. And, that, and this is um, Roe versus Wade. I don't know, how, did any of you see that? <laughs> Do you like it? It was good. Uh, <laughs> it was good. Um, it was on, not, not this last summer, but a year ago. And um, what was remarkable about it was that it was broadcast in the midst of an enormous public discourse around the question of abortion rights, right on the eve of the Supreme Court ruling on Missouri versus Webster, which, as I'm sure you know, um, challenged the whole question of a woman's right to abortion, which had been just unquestioned since 1973 when the Roe versus Wade case uh, went before the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled that women do, in fact, have a right to abort. Um, now, the networks chose to run this not after the not after the decision was in, but in the middle of in the in the middle of this of this controversy, and it took a clear pro-choice position. It was very you know very clear at a time when it was far from clear, certainly in the media's point of view, that most Americans sympathized with that view. In fact, at that time, the media and most of us believed, because of the enormous savvy of the right wing forces, they call themselves right to life, they're really just anti-choice, um, have been having alarming success in um, convincing the nation that most Americans were against the right to abortion, and also at a time, which is still unfortunately going on, when right wing lobbyists have been having an enormous amount of success in protesting against what they considered immoral um, programming to the point where sponsors got so scared of the constituency of the right that they were actually um, taking away their sponsorship and, 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 and shows were being canceled. Um, nonetheless, the network went ahead and did this. So. It, the other thing is, it's politics. The politics of this movie comes through primarily because the two central characters, Jane Rowe, who in the movie is called Ellen Russell, but really is Norma McCorvey, the woman who agreed to become the test case um, for the Supreme Court hearing because she was pregnant and wanted an abortion, and her attorney, Sarah Weddington, who really is the woman who, who um, uh, uh, argued the case before the Supreme Court, which was a first for women, actually, um, were treated with great sympathy and were portrayed by two major movie stars, Holly Hunter and Amy Madigan. This is another thing TV movies do. And the reason they can do it is, again, contradictory. They tend to get really big name stars, particularly women stars, to play in these things because Hollywood movies, theatrical films, have very, very few juicy parts for women. But TV actually plays to a women's audience because um, unlike, you know, when you go to a movie, you don't see commercials. Uh, whoever is the funder is, is, is invisible. We don't know who it is. But when you watch a TV movie, the sponsor is right there selling you things, most of which are household goods and over-the-counter drugs that they know women are the people who are going to buy. So that TV, for, for bottom line economic reasons, is committed to appealing to a female audience. And even in this day and age when feminist ideas are fairly, um, you know, pretty much uh, it, uh, accepted by a whole lot of people, because, <laughs> she's laughing, yeah. Um, uh, because 
they actually care more about female audiences than theatrical films do because theatrical films right now unfortunately play mostly to an 18 to 24 year old age group in which it is still men that buy the tickets and men that choose what movie to see. So movies really are not, yeah, I mean you could just think about what was, you know, what was out this summer. Lethal Weapon 12, you know, <laughs> Batman, I don't know, you know what it is, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger yet again. Um, uh, they're not making a lot of movies with serious parts for women. So big Hollywood stars are very often glad to get these parts because they're juicy. So, okay, now that's the good news. The bad news is, and here's where the limits and the contradictions come in, the, this project was five years in the making. It took these people five years to get up the courage to show this movie. And in the five years that they were producing it, it went through 17 rewrites, which is an enormous number of rewrites. The, the screenwriter, Alison Cross, actually did, did the final rewrite on her honeymoon. Um, that's how antsy the network was about not offending anybody once they decided to run this thing. And in each of these um, rewrites, the anti-choice position and its proponents got more and more space it, their arguments got more and more time, and they were presented more and more sympathetically, while the female characters, in particular Sarah Weddington, were toned down to be much duller than Sarah Weddington actually is. And th this is from uh, interviews with, with the screenwriter herself about what she had to do to get this thing done. Um, moreover, and here's, I guess, probably the most important thing, key scenes. Um, the one which is not on the tape, but which is um, uh, uh, seriously interesting. One in which the Roe character visits an illegal abortion clinic, um, got watered down and censored drastically. And for example, in the original version, they, there were scenes of this place, you know, where there was blood on the floor. And of course there's blood on the floor of an illegal abortion clinic. There's blood on the floor of an operating room in a hospital. Um, also, the text was cut, the script was cut, so that generalizations about the number of women who were dying from illegal abortions or coat hanger abortions was cut out. Now here you see where individualism comes in. Their argument you know, this phony aesthetic argument is, well, um, people want a human interest story. But the real thing is that if you start to talk about this as a class thing that affects huge numbers of women, then you're making a statement about national policy as opposed to just showing a story of one very attractive young woman who happens to go through a bad time. Um, so no coat hangers, nothing like that. And the place itself was actually, it was, it was grim enough. But um, it, it, this is actually kind of funny. Every network has a standards and practices office, which is really the in-house censorship office, that goes through scripts with fine tooth combs and decides whether, quote unquote, um, it offends existing social standards. Now that's a catch-22 right there. Because if you're trying to do something progressive, and you're not allowed to offend existing social standards, what are you supposed to do? Um, the biggest example that I know of that is a, a movie that was, and this is very rare actually on primetime, a, a movie about two lesbians in which um, they were not allowed to be shown kissing because it, it offended existing social standards. Well, you know, if you're making a movie about lesbianism that's sympathetic, but you can't offend existing social standards because people don't want to see two women kissing, then you're in a bind. Okay, so that's what they did. And the, the crazy thing was that they cut out the blood on the floor. And this, you know, you watch television every night and you see blood and gore. People are being shot and gunned down and, and run down by cars. I mean, TV is pretty gruesome. And yet they decided that this little bit of blood on the floor couldn't be shown. So, okay. Um, even in this case, um, uh, 
the, many sponsors bolted. I don't want to go over time. And um, the movie ran at a loss. And again, this is, this is a strange thing. They decided to keep it on the air anyway. Part of the reason was because they had made a commitment to this public interest thing. But part of the reason, and this is something which, again, people don't think about a whole lot, is that there were a lot of people working on this film who were committed to what it was trying to do. And they really fought to keep, you know, they, they, they fought very hard not to have their five years of work go down the drain. Anyway, the network, for whatever reasons, decided to do it. Um, and it was really, it, it was a good movie. It was, it was informational. I mean, I got a daughter who um, grew up in a feminist household, for sure, and, um, but never lived at a time when abortion was illegal. And even as much as she knew about it from me talking, watching this movie was very moving to her because it had never occurred to her what would actually happen if they took away, you know, a woman's right to abortion and she was in this position that Holly Hunter is in. Nonetheless, and this is the last point I want to make, um, the reason why this movie actually made it and they didn't have to falsify the information, it was factual, but nonetheless it worked, is because um, the Jane Roe character is not presented as the most extreme kind of feminist who just wants the right to control her own sexuality and her own body, but rather she's presented as a mother who has gone through the trauma of having to give up one child because her husband has left her when she was pregnant and she has to give this kid to her mother and her mother's real mean to her and doesn't let her see the kid. So when she finds herself pregnant again and she has no money at all, she's working as a carnival barker or something, um, she absolutely cannot stand the thought of going through nine months of pregnancy and giving up this kid for abortion. So what, what the point is that um, they, they maintain this idea that she is presented as somebody who is really still very much maternal in her concerns. There's this horrifying scene where she goes through labor and they take the baby away from her. And so, you know, it doesn't offend existing social standards about motherhood in that sense. You know, she's not presented as some uh, scarlet woman. Um, Okay, and finally, it did a really nice job in terms of class because these two women who were the main characters uh, were seen doing different kinds of work. Um, like the, the intercut scenes like, like Jane Roe would be mopping floors, which is the only work she could do, and then Sarah Weddington would be seen preparing briefs at a time when the legal profession had no interest in women's issues and she got no help from her male colleagues. So this issue of sexism and the way it's kind of a cross-class thing was also brought out. Okay, that's what I want to say. Now, what I have here, and I guess somebody's going to, I'm not used to having somebody do this for me, I usually do it myself. Um, I have a tape here and um, it's divided into four sections and I want to explain to you what I think we'll probably just do the first two sections and then I'll let you, you talk. Um, the first one is L Lois Gibbs and the Love Canal. It's quite short. But it shows you the way in which a film about a woman who organized her community around the question of toxic waste at, um, at Love Canal and ultimately divorced her husband because he was working for the nuclear power industry. Um, and that's really rare on TV for people to get divorced. I mean, usually they do patch things up. Um, they go to therapy um, and they patch things up. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, she did, and she went off and became a full-time organizer, which she is today. But l when you see um, the way it's introduced, it's again, it's very much in the family vein. Um, she, it's presented as a family issue, and this is actually a very good movie. But it's presented very much in terms of a family issue, and it's her kid who gets sick and, and, and ultimately dies, and that spurs her to do this research and become this, this organizer. So, do you want to? The Carpenter story, which was a TV yes. the movie. At the very end of the movie, they were advertising slim, some type of uh, diet. That's right. That's, that's right. That's right. That's right. 
that's right. They always do that, and if you're aware of it, it's very weird. And that's why it's so unusual for the networks to run something about a serious issue like this, because it contradicts the image that the ads project of the American way of life. I mean, where Lana King cures your itch. I mean, what else could you want? You know, <laughs> or Mrs. Dash, and you'll be healthy forever. You know, so what if you, you know, if you try to kill yourself or you can't get an abortion or whatever? So, yeah. Um, Well, not necessarily. Information comes much more, well, first of all, the local news is the biggest money maker of all. But second of all, talk shows, Good Morning America, um, soft news does extremely well. And that's where people get their information. I've had students give me term papers where, um, with facts, and, you know, and I say, where did you get this information? They heard it on a talk show. So that, that's what I mean. You know, and that doesn't even mean that national news would be the best place for them to get it. It's just that the truth is that unfortunately, you know, that, well, not so, I don't know if it's unfortunate or not, but very few people watch the national news. But nonfiction television, which is what um, I spent a long time writing about before I did this, um, nonfiction television encompasses all sorts of forms that we don't think of as informational even things like the Johnny Carson show, where people get on and talk about things. I mean, you know, you ever watch Good Morning America? I mean, it's a, it's a circus, you know, those morning shows. But yet, that is where people get up in the morning and, you know, they don't read the New York Times. They, they watch Good Morning America, and it's a strange conglomeration of things because usually it's largely celebrity interviews and silly stuff like that, and then it's intercut with very, very short little two-minute things about, about the news. So that, that's what I meant by that. So that, that's the kind of information that most Americans get, and that's what they think is going on. Actually, I don't think it's Entertainment Tonight. Um, in fact, it isn't. It, it's Entertainment Tonight is fairly recent. And in fact, um, just as an aside, Entertainment Tonight is in some ways an interesting show because it's the only show on television that takes you behind the scenes of the entertainment industry, which is what you know I've been trying to do. But actually, when when it changed was with the local news. The local news, and this is a, a long and I think interesting story. But the local news in 1970 became a major money maker and they used market research to find out what people wanted and they found out that what people wanted was light sort of banter and attractive anchors that joke around and a lot of weather and a lot of sports and stuff like that and then shows like like morning news you know and shows like that most nonfiction shows that deal with information have taken their cue from local news because local news is so incredibly successful almost everyone watches local news and local news is really a cartoon you know it really is I mean it's like <laughs> you know it's like you know a cat is caught in a tree um, <laughs> it's true it, you know it's, it's uh, you know it, this goofy stuff and you know this is this is the news and I sometimes say this to my students and they get really mad at me because you know they say, well, this is what, you know, we really care about this. Or I say, well, why should they have, you know, like 10 minutes of weather? You ever see all those, those charts? You know, you know, the amount of money that they spend on all of those charts. And they say, well, it's really important that we know how to dress the next day. You know, things like that. So, but, I mean, that isn't news. That's, um, I, I consider local news to be really people who are not journalists at all. They're really actors impersonating your neighbors, you know. <laughs> no, it is. I mean, I, you probably have that here. Um, 
it's, you know, it's like, and, and they have these, these teasers for it, like, you know, when I lived in Pittsburgh, um, which not in Manhattan, it's quite a different thing because there's so much violence going on and they don't do that. But in Pittsburgh, there's really, you know, there's a lot of cats and trees. And also, um, you know, nothing else ever happened. But also they would have these people who would come to town and they would present these ads for the local news that would say, you know, so-and-so really, you know, loves, you know, loves his neighborhood and, and all of that. And it turned out that they just moved there the day before, and they couldn't even pronounce the names of neighborhoods, things like that. So, I mean, and really, these people have agents and make huge amounts of money. They're not journalists. Um, well, there is um, a lot of, of data about this, but mostly it's my experience because I've been teaching this for a long time. It's my experience that um, if people see something on television, because of the power of pictures, they think that if it's that if it's a picture of reality, then it's real, and they don't get the editing and um, you know the way in which a lot of things are left out. So it's, it's my impression, and I actually probably have learned more from my students than I've learned from a lot of books I've read, um, that in fact people do take it seriously, more seriously than they take print, because a picture doesn't lie. It, pictures are very powerful, and they are not media literate, which is a lot of you know, what I, this is what I do in my job, is try to get people to be media literate so that they have a critical sense of, you know, I've been talking about things that I think are actually quite good, but also that they should be aware of how and why the media does what it does and be able to um, more intelligently understand it. And I love it when my students come home from Thanksgiving vacation and say, my parents are so mad at me because we watch the news and, and, and I kept saying, this is this, and they kept saying, oh, why don't you just be quiet? You know, because they start really criticizing everything on the news and then I feel I succeeded. You know, but mostly people do to, don't do believe it, don't, don't you think? Yeah, and I do think it's because I think they don't, they don't trust the print media and they don't trust politicians. But they do trust a picture. That's a great book. Okay, well here Yes. Yeah. There's yeah, to before I even answer that, I'd like to comment on, on I mean what what Bagdikian does is to is to pretty much run down the economic statistics. But actually USA Today, for example, imitates television. So does People Magazine. I mean, print media is imitating that. But the question that you're asking about, I mean, if this were, which I don't believe it is, an ideological monolith, then a movie like Roe vs. Wade would never get put on. And in fact, as I said, many sponsors bolted and it ran at a loss. This was also true of The Day After, which wasn't a very good movie, but it was also true of The Women's Room, which was probably the first and a very... And, um, really serious feminist TV movie. However, as I said, there is a, a contradictory kind of thing going on. 
where and here's where I give a certain amount of credit to the network. You see, the ideology of the FCC is very contradictory. On the one hand, there's a democratic rhetoric which spouts the people's right to know and the press is supposed to be um, the objective watchdog that's representing our interest. And people who go into the field, if, you know, if they're any good, actually want to do that. The other side of that, and this is the contradiction of capitalism, is that the bottom line is money. So there is this struggle, and I think that, mo that it's more of a struggle than um, a lot of media analysts have, have, have given it credit for, that these people cannot operate without their creative talent. There's a lot of very, very creative people working in the media. And so to some extent, particularly when you think about the fact that TV as a production process is a really collective process. It's not like writing a novel. It's a whole socialized workplace. If you ever go out on location and see a film being made, you see, um, you know, the stars are nothing. Um, it's all of the people who run the equipment and things like that. And they went into it, many of them, because they're idealistic. So I think the answer is that in certain cases, and this is where I have a Gramscian view, if you, you know, of, um, of the way culture o operates, which is that um, it is not that that there, in order to maintain power, um, the power structure has got to allow for a certain amount of dissent, because this is not fascism, and because we call ourselves a democracy. So, to a certain extent, they're forced to give a little bit. But this kind of thing happens so rarely. And the other thing is that if Roe versus Wade was a series where you followed the adventures of, um, of Jane Roe every single week, the way you follow the Cosby show, no, they wouldn't run it. They don't run things like that. But because these are one-shot deals, and you see it once, and then you don't see it again, they don't mind. Um, it, it's the one place where they actually are much more likely to allow you to be serious and grim. And so that is why, I mean, the whole point of this is that I, I believe that TV movies are, in fact, the place where um, people are allowed to do the most contradictory thing.